Hello guys, so basically we end up with the valvular heart disease, we're done with the valvular heart disease, ischemic heart disease, and um, yeah, so basically today's topic is uh, infective endocarditis, so we'll talk about infectious, which is infective endocarditis and rheumatic fever. Now, uh, the, I think the approach for infecting the carditis, we have two approaches here. First, the organism, and the second, maybe some clinical features or complications. So I will know from the case that he's talking about infective endocarditis. Usually, guys, you will see fever plus murmur. All right? Fever plus murmur, maybe he will give you blood cultures, maybe not. But fever plus murmur usually indicate endocarditis and probe otherwise. And the way that you differentiate, uh, so it's either staph or, uh, or strep. So here maybe you can divide into staph, right? Or strep. Now, when we are talking about staph, the most common staph that the cause of, of endocarditis is basically staph aureus. So you can say here staph aureus is number one. Right? Uh, another staph that also could cause endocarditis is staph epidermis. Right? Staph epidermis. Uh, when you're talking about staph aureus, uh, you have to remember some things about it. First, it's usually acute, in, in, acute infective endocarditis, not subacute. So usually we are usually we are dealing of one to two days high fever. So when I say when when we are talking about acute, that's mean within just one to two days or 48 hours. Second, still mitral valve. By the way, my, uh, endocarditis usually indicate my usually mitral valve is the most common valve. However, in, in, in the staph aureus could be tricuspid valve because it's associated with line infections. So let's make it clear. So the staph aureus could be also, you have to put into your mind, tricuspid valve. And when we are talking about tricuspid valve, because tricuspid valve usually it's in the right side of the heart, so when you are talking about tricuspid valve, usually you are talking about right-sided endocarditis at the same time. And because it's right-sided, so IV drug abusers, because the venous system go to the right side of the heart first and tricuspid valve. So IV drug abusers is really big times here. So you can say IV drug abusers, right, which is IV DU. So you get IV drug abusers which is almost the same as tricuspid valve, which is almost the same as acute presentation, which is basically staph aureus. It's right. So guys, it's still mitral valve, please. So still mitral, because I said it's mitral valve is the most common valve that affected. But this is a kind of unique. Could be tricuspid valve also affected. And this could be associated with IV drug abusers or any, or any usually line infections like CV line. Line infections. All right. When we are talking about staph EP, the next the next key point is prosthetic heart, prosthetic valve. Right? Usually prosthetic valve. By the way, in staph EP, usually the valve is normal valve. I mean, the valve is not abnormal to start with. So staph EP affect the normal valve. So you can say effect here just in case if you're confused effect the normal valve and again mitral valve is the most common now for strip uh, you can also device strip let's make it yes sorry um, yeah for strip maybe you can divide strip also into two types and yeah, let's make it like this so for strip is you have two types of strip First, streptococcal viridens, or viridens streptococci, which is the most common cause, but this is usually subacute in endocarditis. So you get strept viridens. And when you're talking about strept viridens, usually the patient have, have uh, the valve, look at that. The valve to start with is abnormal valve. What I mean by abnormal valve, like for example, let's say the patient have mitral valve prolapse, or the patient have mitral valve stenosis. There is already a problem in the valve to start with, and then the patient have dental procedures, and after the dental procedures, basically uh, the valve now affected, and the patient have just get fever and memory, which is 
which is just endocarditis. Or the second cause, it's not so common, but it's usually a border question, is stratococcal pubis. And when you are always, when you are talking about stratococcal pubis, you need to make sure it's usually associated with a colonic cancer or inflammatory bowel disease. And very high yield and very easy. So colonic cancer associations or inflam any, any inflammatory bowel disease. Right, which is which is basically Crohn's disease or self colitis, inflammatory bowel disease. So now, what are the scenarios here, guys? Really, it's 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 interesting. So the scenario is basically maybe you will get a patient with colonic cancer and in classical and you will see in the blood culture cystococcal pubis. What is next? Do echo to see the valve, right? So basically, he will maybe he will give you the questions about colonic cancer or the patient have inflammatory bowel disease on and on blood culture showed streptococcal pubis. So what is next? The next step, do echo for the patient or what is the second organ you will need to look for? Just go and look for the heart, right? So this is really, really uh, important and uh, important question. So streptococcal viridens, uh, it's, it's just usually after dental procedures. And the valve to start with, so patient past medical history, again, so this is the past medical history, like mitral valve prolapse. This is past medical history, right? All of that, guys, past medical history, please. Colonic cancer, past medical history. Mitral valve prolapse, past medical history. Now, prosthetic valve, just patient have prosthetic valve a few months ago, maybe one month usually, you go with the staph baby, right? IV drug of user, it's really common with this and tricuspid valve or line infection usually common with this, with with the with the with the staff sorry with the staff uh, aureus the staff aureus okay so you get all of these uh, again too much yellow but it's interesting and it is uh, it's not so hard uh, how you will make it just one word for each microorganism. So if I'm if I'm telling you what's the streptococcus your answer will be colonic cancer inflammatory. What's the streptoviridens, your answer dental infection because it's here. Staph EP, prosthetic valve, staph aureus, most common with the IV drug abusers or line infections. So we done with the first part of infected endocarditis. I think the, the first part is the most important part which is basically microorganisms. Now after the first, after we've done the first part, now we need to go with the clinical features. So usually the patient, let's say the patient around 20 or 40 years, um, female or male, it's not a big deal. So this is usually not a specific. And then she came, let's say the patient have known case of mitral valve prolapse before in the past medical history, this past medical history. And now the patient came with just fever and the murmur, right? Maybe plus negative spleen. So splenomegaly is also important. And he will tell you, and he will tell you blood cultures for the patient so you will see cultures. Because these are important criteria, by the way, in step two to diagnose uh, to diagnose infective endocarditis. You need two. You need you need fever, okay, and you need culture positive. Fever and culture positive, sure plus heart, which is basically the, the murmur. Here, at least from the history. So, in this blood culture for the patient showed streptococcal viridens or viridens streptococci, which is the most common cause of subacute, by the way, this subacute infective um, endocarditis. Subacute, uh, sorry, subacute infective endocarditis is the most common cause, uh, caused by uh, subacute, is caused by streptococcal viridens. Now, after that, you get into complications. Uh, when we are talking about complications, also it's easy. It's usually due to two first two mechanisms. So either due to the emboli, which is so the infective endocarditis. By the way, uh, it affects what? Let's say this is the heart. Let's say this is the valve. So the valve is already damaged because the valve damaged. Now there is some fibrin and maybe some platelet. So here you will see some fibrin, some platelet. So because the valve is already damaged, and then uh, now the organism, which is basically very dense to cocci, comes and sits here. So this is the citrate, which is the very dense. And now it will destruct the valve and makes what? Makes this stuff, which is vegetations. Right? And this is non-sterile vegetations. So this non-sterile 
vegetations because after that you will get sterile vegetation. So this non-sterile vegetations because the microorganisms is here, right? So now when you are talking about complications. Uh, either due to the microembolism, so these vegetations, look at this, this vegetation maybe just go on, go on, go where? So microembolization, right? This is the most, not the most, this is the first complications. And the microembolization could be, could, you will see these vegetations in any organ. So maybe you will see, or uh, you will see these vegetations in, uh, when it will go to the organs, maybe it will make thrombosis, or maybe just, let's say, lung. Septic emboli, so you will see the lungs, it looks like this. What are these dots? This is just septic emboli because of the two vegetations, right? Cephalene, in cephalene you will see cephalene amygdala. Right, which is big cephalin. Or these are the three terms, which is a kind of hard. It's really not hard, guys. If it is in the fingernail, so again, location, location, locations. Once you will know locations, you will know the pathology after that. In the fingernail, call it splinter hemorrhage. In the finger, call it ocellar nodule, which are just, let's say, just vegetation because it's microembolization process. And if it is in the palm of the hand, we will call it just erythema. Uh, palmar erythema, all right? Uh, genuine lesion, sorry, not palmar erythema, genuine lesion. So again, if it is in the tip of fingers, this is uh, this is splinter hemorrhage. If it is in the finger, this is ocellar nodule. On palm of the hand, this is genuine lesion. So these are these lesions, uh, these lesions which are really not so common. So these lesions basically are just due to microembolization. So again, this is splinter hemorrhage. This is the first one. Ocellars nodules, so this is the second one, and January lesion. January. And you just need to know the organ. This is nail, this is finger, this is palm, this is rash, this is nodule, this is petechiae, because it's hemorrhage. We call it splinter hemorrhage. Yeah, for some reason, this is very hard for a student to memorize it. It's really not so big deal. And it is, um, I don't think it's really common. It's not common nowadays, and I don't think it's common question wise. But I don't know, the student is just obsessive to memorize this stuff. It's, it's okay, you can memorize it. It's present, I think, in first aid or any, any, any book. So again, usually the way that I make it in the tail, splinter hemorrhage, in the nail, splinter hemorrhage, finger ulcers, and here, pulmonations. Now, these are microembolizations. Now, other than the microembolization, you have immune complex problem, right? Which is immune complex deposit. And so, immune complex deposit problems, uh, two things. Either the patient present with the glomerulonephritis, and usually glomerulonephritis is presented as hematuria plus white blood cell cast, cast guys. So you have white blood cell cast, or maybe, maybe, maybe the retina is affected. Now, the retina is affected. We call the Roth's spot. And Roth's spot is, is, is just a spot. So it's just, retina is just, just looks like this, the white and surrounded by, it's usually a white center surrounded by a hemorrhagic area or red area. Just this is Roth's spot. Again, this is really not so common, but it, I think glomerulonephritis is interesting. Uh, so anytime you mature red blood cells plus this picture, that's mean glomerular disease, which is glomerulonephritis. So these are complications. If you will make another one or two scenarios and then we will done, we'll go to the next one. I like hematuria, by the way, uh, as a topic, so I will talk about that also in, in Reno. But let's say hematuria and infective endocarditis. Let's say the patient have a red blood cell cast. If the red blood cells cut negative, that means there is no red blood cells cast. So what is the reason why the patient have hematuria if there is no red blood cell cast? Okay, let's go to the easy part. If there is a red blood cell cast positive, your diagnosis will be what? We just mentioned it, right? It's just here. So the answer will be glomerulonephritis. If red blood cells cast negative, what do you think the answer will be? Right, it's infarction, guys. So a kidney infarction. And always, always infarction presented as ischemia as bleeding. Ischemic infarctions, uh, ischemic infarction, which is, uh, sorry, mesenteric infarction, the GI, presented as a bleeding diarrhea. Kidney infarction presented as a bleeding uh, hematuria, right? Heart infarction, which is MI, 
I mean, you will see the blood, but the, the, <laughs> not present as bleeding, but you will see the blood in the cross pictures that are just covered by blood because it's necrosis. So, yeah, so this is just hematuria. I think this is interesting, hematuria as a question for, um, for endocarditis. So let's go to the second topic, which is rheumatic fever. And I hope I can make the rheumatic fever, sorry, I hope I can make rheumatic fever just within one slide. It's a consequences, guys, always, always. Look, when, when we talk about, when you talk about the infective endocarditis, you look at the slide back, you will see it's just a, a whole pictures. So you will go with the microorganisms. After the microorganism, the clinical features fever, murmur, splenomegaly, which is there, and after that you get two important complications. All right, and we're done. Now for rheumatic fevers, first the patient age, 15 year, let's say female, six criteria. Let's say joint pain, and this joint pain is movable. Joint pain. I mean, today is knee pain. This is today right and then let's say after one week ankle pain so she came to she come to you and usually guys joint pain in the children is usually not so common i mean when a child complain of joint pain you have to think what's going on really what's going on i mean joint pain in, gi in child rheumatic fever septic arthritis number two juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or stool disease maybe as a patient as this age so you don't have you don't have much by the way again so it's usually either rheumatic fever septic ar septic arthritis always always keep it to your mind septic arthritis rheumatic fever uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or stool disease which is almost the same now when we are talking about yeah the, the joint pain in case of rheumatoid uh, sorry in case of rheumatic fever so she came pain, wrist pain today and then after that everything was fine and then after two weeks she will tell you I have hip pain maybe after another one week there is on a few days there is ankle pain so what is that this is the definitions of migratory polar arthritis and migratory polar arthritis really is significant features for rheumatic fever and also significant feature for another disease by the way migratory polar arthritis it's not at this age maybe a little bit older yeah it's uh, disseminated gonorrhea right not just the gonorrhea the normal one disseminated gonorrhea represented as migratory arthritis a plus a rash plus tenosynovitis Right, so this minute gonorrhea is really very high up. Right, so basically here you first you have migratory arthritis, and this is the first criteria. So you done with the first criteria. Plus, I will make another criteria is movement disorders, and we are talking about movement disorders. I mean, chorea, maybe nodules, which is subcutaneous nodules, right? And these nodules subcutaneous. So you get three criteria now. You get three criteria. Rash, which is uh, also important, erythema marginatum. Right? So you get four. Let me again, let me remember the criteria. These are joint joints criteria. So first you get migratory arthritis, number one, you get chorea, subcutaneous nodules, these are nodules, and rash and say, hey, I forget the first one, which is I think most important, maybe chest pain, middle fever, but but don't forget carditis. And when you're talking about carditis, he will not tell you carditis in the questions, he will tell you chest pain, patient have chest pain plus negative troponin high. And when, when you hear a troponin, usually the student, when, you, when they hear a troponin, they just remember myocardial infarction, which is good, because it's really specific for myocardial infarction. This is the second enzyme that increases and the most specific enzyme that in uh, myocardial infarction if you remember but again always remember myocarditis is another cause and myocarditis is usually caused by a uh, coxsackie virus and here you have another cause which is just carditis caused by rheumatic fever itself right rheumatic fever itself now so these are guys these are the clinical pictures for rheumatic fever and these are very high yield criteria they call it Johnson criteria this is the major you have minor criteria plus negative, so I'll make it here, minor criteria like fever and CRP and ESR. Usually these are not big deals. So fever, please look at that. Fever is not big deal in rheumatic fever, while fever is very important 90% of the cases to diagnose infective endocarditis. Because the mechanism is different. That's why fever here is not a big deal. Because the mechanism is totally different. Let's talk about the mechanism. So you're done with the first one. So you have almost three topics in rheumatic fever. So you're done with the first topic, which is this one, 
Now you get the history and this patient comes to you and then he will ask about mechanisms. So group A streptococcal and it's not all the group A streptococcal. You need a streptococcal that get M protein because nephrogenic streptococci does not have M protein. That's why nephrogenic streptococcal is not is not a cause for rheumatic fever. Why? Because after streptococcal, this is antigen. After that, antibody mediated. And now, once you will get antibody mediated, and this usually needs time, let's say two weeks. Now, this antibody is goes and attack the M protein of a group A streptococcal, right? Go and attack an M protein and get an, and go and attack another organ, which is heart. And that's the interesting point here. Now, when you are talking about the heart, you have to know that the superficial layer of the heart is myocardium, right? And you are talking about myocardium. Now, the patients really big time have the carditis one, which is the troponin increase and maybe a little bit low fever and chest pain. So basically, this is myocarditis as an acute presentation. That's why usually this is acute presentations. Later on, uh, later on, maybe the patient in myocardium, you will see this histocyte surrounded by debris or whatever the tissue, but here basically is histocyte surrounded by some kind of crazy reactions and we call this issue of bodies. And he will not ask you about issue of bodies as a question, because you know your SMLE never ask about these names, but he will tell you what is that, maybe, maybe you know, you have to know this is histocyte. Right? Where is this? This is not in the endocardium, guys. Again, location. This is in the myocardium. Right? When you are talking about the heart, this is superficial layer of the heart. So the first is superficial layer of the heart, which is myocardium. Not superficial, I mean this is the middle, basically. The first thing is pericardium. The pericardium is not a big deal. So antibodies, again, antibodies comes and attack, goes and attack the protein, which is the M protein, which is by group A streptococcal, and also goes and attack the heart. And when the antibodies attack the heart, you need to know which location of the heart that get damaged. First, we are talking about myocardium, and usually myocardium as a location is the early presentation, usually acute myocarditis, you die. Maybe late, after let's say a few months, it present as a shock bodies. So you guys done with myocardium. Now, the second one is the most important, is the endocardium, right? And again, I make it layer, I make the, the, make the upper one is the myocardium, which is the uh, middle, and the second one is endocardium, which is inside. Now, when you are talking about endocardium, don't make it acute, because this needs years. And you all, you, I think, remember, because we talked about that several times, if it is after 10 years, so how, how, how is the age now? The age is 25. So let's the age is 15. Sorry, let's say 25 years. What is the problem? First, what is the valve? Always mitral. But what the patient present? So okay, let me let me make it in different. I think this is good. Yeah, I need to make it as I don't know. Wait a second. I really I need to make it more neat. Yeah, I have I have a space, but I'm not sure. Okay, let's say this is 25 years. And after that, 40 years. Yeah, I'll make it like this. So 25 years, let's, we are talking about mitral. So you get mitral regurg. Right? And let's say 40 or maybe 30 years. 30 years maybe or 40, you get mitral, what, stenosis. It's very high yield. Very, very high yield. So endocarditis. And um, sorry, not endocardium, endocardium involvement. When you are talking about endocardium, that's when you are talking about the valve. And when you are talking about the valve, which valve? It's usually mitral valve. And we are talking about mitral valve. If it is, let's say, after 10 years, put mitral regard. If it is after 20 years, put mitral stenosis. And you will be fine. Now, at this point, which is really interesting, at this point, which is the endocardium and the chronic, here, you will not name it any more rheumatic fever. This is rheumatic heart disease. Right? This is rheumatic. Now we are talking about rheumatic heart disease. So these are the features of rheumatic heart disease. And please, the mechanism of rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, due to antibodies. While the mechanism of endocarditis is due to the infection, which is microorganism. The, anti the microorganism will not cause the damage, guys. 
microorganism is the primary, but it's not the primary cause of the damage. The primary cause of the damage is the antibody. And what is this type of 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 immunity of uh, sorry of hypersensitivity reaction? It's type two hypersensitivity reactions. Type two hypersensitivity reactions, right? So this is the type two hyper sensitivity reactions. Now one more thing, sorry I ran out of time, but I just remember one more thing. When you are talking about endocarditis, by the way, you have three you have three causes, endocarditis. You have three features. So maybe maybe the vegetation is a sterile vegetation or maybe the vegetation is non sterile. Now, when you are talking about non-sterile vegetations, the answer will be just infective endocarditis, which is infection cause. When you are talking about sterile, you have two causes. Either the mechanism is due to autoimmune cause, autoimmune problem, and usually uh, the, the answer is SLE, and here is malentic endocarditis. Oh, sorry, it's not malentic, it's Lipansac. Sorry, sorry. This is lip and sac. Yeah. Sorry, it's lip and sac endocarditis. So here you are talking about lip and. I yeah, not show you. I will not tell you what is lip and sac because they don't like the names. Even. Yeah, I don't know if the spelling is right. Lip and sac endocarditis here. But what you need to know sterile autoimmune cellie. If the mechanism is due to the hypercoagulable state, and this hypercoagulable state done by what? Inusine. And this inusine comes from where? Cancer. Here the answer is malentic. Look at these names. It's really interesting. Always. So hypercoagulable is the same as mucin, is the same as cancer. All of them mean the same, which is malentic. Autoimmune is the same as almost SLE, almost the same as sterile. Non-sterile vegetations, here the answer will be infectious cause, which is another type, which, and we are talking about infectious cause. Now, you can go with the whole bunch of infections that we divide into staff, and we divide staff into two types, and we divide into strip, and we already divide the strip into two types. If you, if you real, if you just go back to this slide again, you will see the slide is uh, not so hard. So, and hopefully this slide is helpful. And again, if you just compare, maybe because I don't have sorry space to write, but if you just make simple comparison, if the organism itself go and attack the valve, this is endocarditis, and the main presentation is fever and age is not an answer. If the antibody attack attack the heart and it's usually attack the myocardium layer, and the age is an answer because the age is usually younger age, this is rheumatic fever. So totally, totally different. So that's why, guys, there is no way to get the questions wrong or no way to mix up between both. No way. There are, because it's really totally different clinical features. You get fever and murmur plus splenomegaly with endocarditis. You get my, my six criteria, which is joint criteria, with rheumatic fever. Again, thanks for your time and thanks for watching this video or this lectures. The second lecture will be pericardium, maybe, and the last one will be congenital heart disease, and hopefully it will be done soon with the uh, pathology heart disease. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.